Good morning and thank you for joining our webinar this morning. We have John Wilkins here from Bytes and Chris Devere from VMware who will be going through the webinar with you. I'm now going to pass you over to John from Bytes. Hi, morning everyone. Uh, as you're probably all aware, VMware are a long-standing tier one vendor for Bytes and we have their top level of accreditations here. Um, Chris, who will be presenting from VMware, has got a huge amount of experience in this field and he covers the subject matter in a very clear to understand and enjoyable manner, so it should be a good webinar to see. Uh, the VCHS hybrid cloud, it's having an unprecedented take up within our customer base and the marketplace in general at the moment. So this topic is very hot and has huge relevance right now. It's the best fit cloud solution for the majority of our customers as it's running on vSphere which is identical to their own data centers. So I'm now going to hand over to Chris and take it away. Okay, so I'm Chris Devere from, uh, from VMware. Let me just uh, talk you through over the next few minutes about um, VCHS, which stands for vCloud Hybrid Service, which is VMware's entry into the cloud cloud business, the infrastructure as a service cloud business. So let me just explain where we've come from with this. Um, and um, just hold on a second. Okay, that's better. So and uh, so if we if you look in the bottom left hand corner of this slide, which I've got up now, you can see that eight years ago. Amazon introduced uh, Elastic Cloud Compute, uh, EC2, and it um, introduced S2 storage um, eight years ago. So effectively, Amazon really invented this infrastructure as a service market, and they've done a brilliant job since then. Fairly shortly afterwards, um, a new man took over at VMware called Paul Moritz, and he laid down the strategy for VMware's cloud. And what he said was that VMware is strong, in the hypervisor, and but the hypervisor, though it's necessary for cloud, by itself it isn't cloud. So what he said, which was probably not rocket science, was that VMware was in a unique position to be able to build tools on top of the hypervisor to allow customers to, to deliver private clouds within their own environments. Um, and indeed, we've been we've been working along that path for the last. Uh, last six years, and, and now that's manifesting itself in what we call the software-defined data center. But what was cleverer in terms of Paul Moritz's strategy was he said, look, what if we could persuade people who wanted to build their own clouds to build their, their clouds on the same platform as people are using internally? Then what that would mean would be that customers could logically extend their IT environments from their on-premises environment grab some cloud um, in one of the public service providers' clouds, and they would be able to see that as a logical extension of their own environment, or they should be able to treat it as that. And some of the key aspects you know, with this would be that workload would be able to move from one of these environments to the other and back again without any conversion. And importantly, um, the, uh, the IT department would be able to have all the benefits of a private cloud with the elasticity of, uh, of, a, of a public cloud as well. So VMware has worked with service providers to build these clouds, and VMware has um, now decided to become one of these uh, service provider um, cloud uh, providers with VCHS. And, um, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about this. So that effectively is a strategy that we've been working on, not just suddenly, but um, we've, been, we've been working on really for, for the last six years, almost as long really as Amazon has been uh, in, in the public cloud space. So the key, the key issue here, really the key di difference between this approach and what Amazon is doing, and again, this is not meant to be a criticism of Amazon. Amazon is great if you really wanted to, to build something and perhaps start off in Amazon, if you're building the next Facebook or you're building, building the next Netflix or something like that. But if you wanted to move workload from on-premises uh, on a VMware environment into Amazon, you would have to convert that workload. And likewise, if you wanted to bring the workload back, again, you'd have to convert the workload to bring it back on-premises. Uh, and as you probably realize, every time you convert uh, you know, software, something you know, uh, may not go quite right. And so um, there is some risk associated with doing that. 
So as the VMware platforms are absolutely identical, uh, there isn't this requirement to um, to convert workload in a in a VMware based environment. So that's really where um, VMware was coming from, and really this is in the green box below. This is really the key essence of what VMware's cloud story is about. It's about being able to ma manage some resource in those public clouds, really as if it is a logical extension of an organization's internal IT infrastructure. So importantly, the same security tools, the firewalls and the uh, VPNs and the, the, the NAT addressing and things like that, the same policies, the same management, uh, one could call the same application, uh, so could call the same help desk, and importantly, the same applications, as I mentioned before, can move between these environments. So, so the, the story for VMware's, uh, or VMware's cloud story is effectively different to that of AWS and um, of uh, Microsoft Azure and indeed of people like Google Cloud as well. So it's really about being, being compatible with an on-premises environment. So why do we think this may be, may be of value? Well, there's probably a no number of reasons. Um, agility and cost and, uh, and compliance being, being some of those. So just looking at the issue of agility, I mean, quite often when we talk to customers um, and, you know, we talk to IT organizations and, and other parts of um, our customer organizations, what they say is that when a customer sits, uh, a customer requests some resource, the time it takes uh, um, before that user is able to actually sit down and log on can easily be weeks or months, particularly if there's some sort of procurement process in the middle of that. And, and one of the surprising things that we found is that quite often these steps are put in, the, the approvals and the change management and so on, are steps put in quite often to slow down the sprawl of, of physical hardware. So they don't necessarily fit that well with a kind of cloud, uh, well, in the world of cloud. So the question would be, if it currently takes weeks or months to, to, to make uh, more IT resource available, what would it mean to an IT organization and indeed the businesses that they are serving if some IT resource could be, could be made available not in weeks or, or months, but in a few hours. So one of the first customers we had was a, um, uh, a um, <clears throat> consulting company, and what that consulting company wanted to be able to do was that as soon as it won an, an, uh, a contract from a customer, from a client, it wanted to set up the IT environment for that, uh, for that customer, that joint environment, on the same day that they, that, that they won the uh, contract to give the customer the impression that they'd started work straight away. And importantly, at the end of the contract, they knew that they could bring that workload back into their premises or indeed move it to the customer without having to do any kind of conversions. The second issue is to do with cost. Now, at VMware, and if you're familiar with VMware over the last few years, you know we've, we've been talking about the kind of road to 100% to virtualization. We quite often ask, you know, are you 50% virtualized or are you 60% you know, virtualized and this kind of thing, um, as if 100% virtualization is the kind of nirvana. Now, on the, on the whole, that, that's a great place to be, but if a customer is building its environment to its peak workloads, and its peak workloads are substantially higher than its steady state environment, then it still means that even if one is 100% virtualized, one could still be running at uh, less than um, uh, less than 100% IT utilization, simply because one has to build for these uh, for, for these peak workloads. So in this example here, for instance, if one was building for uh, the peak workload and the steady state was at 50% of that, even if one had um, uh, even if one had 100% virtualization, one would still be running at 50% utilization. So the question would be. What if one could build one's infrastructure to one's steady state environments and effectively use something like a hybrid cloud to be able to um, handle these peaks? What would that mean in terms of cost savings if one had to have so many fewer racks, indeed potentially so many fewer data centers even in some cases? So potentially we could be talking about you know, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions, or in some cases tens of millions of pounds per year savings if one didn't have to build for this, these kind of peak, uh, peak environments. Um, now, sometimes I mean, this, this is one survey of indeed hundreds, and they all come out with the same sort of uh, results. 
why people aren't moving to the cloud, uh, and indeed there is, a, there is a move towards it, but the main objections are always around security, integration with uh, back-end IT, uh, how they can bring information, uh, the data back, regulatory requirements and things like that. Those tend to be the kind of objections or, or the roadblocks towards moving towards the cloud. So on the whole, with, um, with the VMware VCHS hybrid cloud, on the whole, um, the, the grabbing of some additional resource in, in, within VCHS looks almost like, uh, like having another internal data center to the IT organization. So as far as IT is concerned, you know, ha grabbing a, a chunk of VCHS looks as though it's, uh, it's just simply managing another uh, uh, internal data center, and certainly that's how it will look on the, um, uh, on the dashboards one's using. One can use the same tools that one's currently using for, for the internal, uh, internal environment, same firewalls, same policies, that kind of thing. So those are some of the, some of the advantages. So just moving forward then to um, uh, what, what the VCHS environment is. So you can see at the top left, it's a cloud service uh, which is owned and operated by VMware. Um, it will be sold through our partners, such as Bytes, in the same way as we sell our current, pro current products. And um, it will, we, are, um, uh, we intend to hold the data in country, whichever countries we're in. So we have some data centers, as I'll show you, in the UK. The data will be held in the UK, not in any other country, such as Ireland or, um, or, or the US. And the, the part in the middle here in blue about license portability, with some caveats, people like Microsoft and Citrix and so on agree that uh, one can move uh, one's licenses that, that they've purchased for on-premises into the hybrid cloud. Now, there are some caveats associated with, with all of these. Bytes is particularly strong in this area and indeed would be able to advise you know, uh, what conditions one can move uh, licenses into the hybrid cloud and um, what, um, what aspects of one's licenses would, you know, would prevent that. But on the whole, Microsoft is um, supportive of being able to move, um, uh, move licenses into the hybrid cloud. So um, with that, then let me just, just, just step forward and explain what it is that we have. So at the moment, as far as, v as, far as infrastructure as a service is concerned, VMware has two flavors of a capacity offering and we are not selling individual VMs in the way that Amazon does. So if we come back to the thought that really this is a logical extension of an IT environment, what VMware is providing is, again, a ch are chunks of resource which the IT organization would be managing. So, so there are two offerings at the moment, two, uh, two SKUs. There is a dedicated cloud platform and a virtual private cloud platform. The dedicated cloud platform is dedicated in the terms of uh, having a dedicated um, CPU and RAM. Effectively, one gets a dedicated blade. Storage is shared, and indeed, uh, bandwidth and IP addresses are shared. Um, the virtual private cloud is a pure multi-tenanted platform. So if you can see with these chunks here, the first thing is that there, there is a commitment period uh, of, of at least a month, and one could have a commitment period of up to three years if one wanted to. And then one takes chunks of this resource, um, and that th this color coding here, red, blue, yellow, and uh, green, are, are amounts of resource that can be scaled independently. So if you wanted more CPU and RAM, more storage, more, uh, more bandwidth, indeed more IP addresses, you could have more of those independent, independently of the other components. So one's buying a chunk of resource, either dedicated or uh, multi-tenanted with a virtual private cloud. The SKU is slightly smaller for virtual private cloud. Um, and one would tend to use a dedicated SKU for things like, uh, particularly for some licensing issues. So Oracle, for instance, will not allow customers to run on a multi-tenanted environment. So one would have, a, have to have a dedicated SKU for that. And likewise, uh, Microsoft desktop li licenses can only be run on a dedicated environment for, for licensing reasons. So these are two chunks of resource here. And, uh, and Bytes can help further if you wanted to get, uh, have that tailored for, for your own environment. Now, importantly at the bottom here, you can see that um, firewalls, VPNs, load balancers, um, I, disk I.O., um, HA, um, DHCP, and NATs, 
net addressing, they are the, there is no additional charge for these as there are, as there are on, on, on most other cloud environments. Importantly, there's no charge for Disk I.O., which is something that either Amazon does charge for, so it's a bit of a surprise at the end of each month when one gets an, a, an additional charge. Importantly, uh, there is no, um, uh, this platform is a highly available, highly available platform because it's a VMware platform, and VMware makes no additional charge for that. So for other environments, one would tend to um, have to build one's own high availability into that. So in, in Amazon, if you wanted high availability, you'd have to build that across a number of availability zones, and this wouldn't be a trivial thing to do. So one would probably have to employ a consultant or something like that. So it, it's a slightly different focus. We are focusing really at enterprise customers. Amazon was probably focusing at the, uh, the kind of developer or someone getting a thing going. Certainly originally that, that was the case for them. So, um, uh, quite often at this stage, people ask me, how do we compare cost-wise with Amazon? So as I go through this, you'll see that really the, the, we're aiming at different markets, but still Amazon is the, uh, the, the market leader you know, by far. Um, to give you a rough, rough idea, because we just did a comparison for a customer, without high availability, we're probably about 20 to 25% more expensive than Amazon, uh, just for pure, pure compute. If you build in HA, Amazon is probably about 40% more expensive than us, just as a rough comparison. And that includes the kind of price reductions that we've, we've been through recently. So um, uh, that just, just gives you some, some sort of a feel, so it's so fairly similar. Um, one would connect to this cloud typically over a secure IPsec uh, or SSL VPN connection. So one would use the internet to connect to this. Um, and the, the dedicated cloud, one would, one would connect to typically with a uh, 10 megabit per second connection and a virtual private cloud, uh, uh, sorry, a dedicated cloud with a 50 megabit per, per second uh, connection and virtual private cloud, 10 megabit, 10 megabit per second uh, connection. One can also have a dedicated environment, uh, a dedicated line, so one could have a higher bandwidth uh, connection into this uh, 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 data center and uh, one could choose a um, telco provider of choice to provide this dedicated line into the, into the data center. So one could have 10 gigabit or, uh, or you know, typically one gigabit uh, connections. Um, so the, because both of these environments, the environment in the vCloud hybrid service and also typically what people are using on, on premises are VMware environments, the same tools could be used for managing both environments. So the vSphere client can be used to manage um, both, uh, both environments. If one's using vCenter operations, you would just see additional, some additional resource that vCenter operations would be monitoring. Uh, vCloud Automation Center could be the interface to this, as indeed to other clouds if you're using that as well. So importantly, the same tools would work on-premises as would work uh, with, with vCHS. And we have to say this because uh, sometimes we create the impression that one has to build a private cloud before you can actually connect to VCHS. That's not the case. If you wanted to build a hybrid cloud, you could do so. And all you need is, uh, is vSphere if you wanted to be able to do that. So you just need to have the pure hypervisor and you can grab some more resource in the cloud. So uh, the more tools you have on premises, the easier it is to manage it. But you don't have to have done that first. And indeed, if you have no on-premises and you want to just to start in the cloud like Amazon, all you would need is a web, uh, web browser to get going with that. So, um, uh, so where are we? So we have a number of um, uh, sites in the States. We have four at the moment in, in the USA. Uh, there's two more that's about to open. Uh, we have one in the UK at the moment, which is in Equinix in Slough. And we have a second one opening at Digital Realty in Chessington, which will be open in July. Um, so those are, so those two are um, uh, in the UK, which are relevant for us here. And uh, later on this year, we expect to have um, Germany and France built out as well, some presence in Germany and France. Um, and again, where we have these data centers, we will keep the data in those, in those countries. Um, outside Europe, we expect to have in Asia Pacific, just, just as a matter of interest, um, Singapore, Australia, and Japan uh, within 2014. Um, so, the, so we started off with 
two infrastructure as a service offerings, the dedicated cloud, as I mentioned, and the virtual private cloud. And we've just introduced the first of a number of uh, disaster recovery as a service offerings. That this first one that we have is based on uh, vSphere replication. So any of you who are familiar with vSphere replication will, will understand how this works. So this is the, replication, the replicating of um, uh, VMs from one environment to another. In this case, it would be from on-premises to, uh, to the uh, DR instance of VCHS in the cloud. Um, the, uh, the, what's known as the recovery point objective, in other words, the gap between taking a copy and um, the, um, uh, in other words, how long the gap may be if you had a failure, that could be as low as 15 minutes. Uh, and that really depends on the amount of bandwidth that, that there is. Um, coming from the customer site into VCHS, but it could be low as 15 minutes, and the recovery time objective should be significantly less than four hours. So this is designed for uh, not to replace things like S uh, Site Recovery Manager or other um, uh, uh, synchronous um, uh, um, replicating uh, uh, synchronous uh, um, disaster recovery solutions. This is really designed more for those environments which don't have DR at the moment, maybe just backup or something like that. As you can see at the bottom here, this includes two tests a year, two seven-day uh, DR tests a year. And also for the, included in the price is that if there was a recovery, one would be able to run for 30 days for no additional charge. Um, and indeed, if you ran over 30 days, then there would be some charge applied um, to, to running that environment in the kind of DR mode. So it's uh, simple to use. So the idea is that the customer would be able to choose the VMs that he would want to have repl uh, replicated and would be able to, to uh, instigate the recovery uh, fairly easily as well. So it's simple to use a recovery as a service is how some people have, have positioned it. Um, so at the top there, you can top, top right, you can see we've got the dedicated and virtual private instance, and we now have this DR instance as, as an additional, um, uh, additional offering. Um, it's sold in terabyte increments, terabyte of uh, disaster recovery capacity, and for that uh, that um, that cost, uh, sorry, for a terabyte of resource, the cost is about 500 pounds per month. Um, so it is a relatively uh, cost-effective uh, solution for those workloads that probably don't have DR at the moment. Uh, this is how, um, and indeed, there are some add-ons uh, here if one wanted to have those. So if one, one did fail over and found one needed more storage or more compute, one can, one can certainly purchase those. Um, this is what, what, a, what a, a colleague of mine put up, and I thought that was quite interesting, and that was that um, so it, the, the red line indicates the importance of um, the applications, perhaps in an organization. Typically, one would have some sort of disaster recovery for, for a number of the most critical ones. And, and the rest of the apps either have you know, some sort of backup, or possibly they have some sort of on-site replication. Perhaps some of those have you know, pretty much nothing. Um, and and, and, the, and um, one would tend to do these things because perhaps for auditing reasons, one needs to have had the, the most critical applications with some sort of cover. But one of the, one of the questions really would be, how long could one survive realistically with just these apps running without all the ancillary apps that, that are running as well? Um, so one of, the, one of the kind of stories that we're trying to put forward is that this kind of replication could possibly give something like uh, disaster recovery or business continuity, continuity to the cloud for you know, something like the cost of the price of backup as well. Um, and I mentioned here Metcalf, Metcalf's law. Some of you may know what that is. So Metcalf was the person who invented Ethernet. He said that the value of a, of a network is roughly proportional to the number of nodes on that network squared. So one could argue in the same sort of thing that all the nodes or the apps in, a, in an organization, the value of business continuity is you know, roughly proportional to the number of apps that you're able to um, provide some sort of disaster recovery for. So, uh, so, which, so this really here, this um, the area where the, the apps just have backup or some sort of on-site replication or indeed nothing at all. That's really where this this solution, this disaster recovery solution, is is designed to fit. 
Um, and indeed, there is much more coming, actually, as far as disaster recovery is, is concerned over the next um, year and a half, incidentally. Okay, so I'll just touch on platform as a service, because that was announced at EMC World last week. Um, so we, we've talked about infrastructure as a service. We are introducing a platform as a service, which is uh, going to be coming out shortly. Um, I was surprised to see this picture um, uh, a few months ago that someone gave, it, gave us uh, in his presentation, and I thought, gosh, I, I saw this you know, 25 years ago. Uh, in case you haven't seen it, this is what the uh, um, customer described, so he didn't describe it very well in terms of what he wanted. This is how the project leader uh, um, understood the, the requirements to be. This is how the analyst spec'd it. This is how the programmer uh, wrote the code. This is what the salesman pictured it would look like. Uh, this is the kind of documentation here. Um, this is as far as operations were installing it. Um, this is what the customer was charged for. And um, this is how it was supported. And indeed, this is really all that the customer wanted. So uh, the reason I put this up here is that you know it takes a long time to develop software, really, is what this still shows after 25 years. Um, and and what I'm trying, uh, that really is a preamble to where this kind of paths fits. So as you may or may not know, um, uh, the platform as a service is a kind of development environment as well as a kind of runtime environment. And some of the value of, of, of something like a PaaS comes from speeding up the development. And part of that speeding, speeding up and the kind of reliable, reliability of the development. So typically, one has a, num a, a number, number of steps to go through in this kind of um, uh, development phase, here, a, a number of testing phases. One of the big advantages with a PaaS is that <clears throat> typically one has to um, set up these uh, these web sphere, uh, sorry, so, so the, these uh, web app and database layers for each of these testing cycles. And uh, with a PaaS, one hasn't got to um, one hasn't got to do that because it's the same environment. So one of the, one of the problems with setting up each of these uh, these environments is first of all it takes time. Secondly, each of these may be subtly different from each other which may mean that the testing isn't, isn't quite as rigorous as it, as it should be. The advantage with, the, um, uh, with a PaaS is that, first of all, the developer hasn't got to code or have any understanding of the uh, different layers that he's coding to. And secondly, that, that, that the testing should be more rigorous and quicker because one uh, doesn't need to kind of set up uh, the different test environments for each, for each of these environments. So that's really what some of the, the value of this uh, PaaS environment is to, to development organizations within within enterprises. Um, one of the other things to do with, um, uh, so certainly one of the key mantras now is all about agile development and continuous development, and these are various books that, that are out about that. Um, and um, there are other PaaS platforms out there. Heroku, Azure, Google, App Engine are, are, are well-known PaaSers. I've put this picture up here, which um, a colleague of mine said when he typed into his spell checker, uh, Heroku, um, the spell checker came up with heroin. And the reason that that's kind of amusing to developers is that um, uh, most of these passes will try and lock you into their environment so that uh, they've really got kind of ongoing, ongoing business. They won't force you to be locked in, but they'll offer you their own databases, they'll offer you their own queuing system and things like that. So the thing about Cloud Foundry is that it's an open source environment. So it means that um, uh, if uh, the operating system of the cloud is the PaaS layer, then really you don't want to be locked into that because we've already been through that with IBM with the mainframe and really with Microsoft with the desktop. Uh, and so really it would be, be silly to be locked in uh, for a third time. So the quickest way I think to understand uh, uh, Cloud Foundry and, and the PaaS in general, but certainly Cloud Foundry, is a real, real case with Comic Relief. Comic Relief was paying half a million, half a, million a year to Oracle um, uh, to, to, to run its software. They, they redeveloped the, the same sort of application or the same capability in four months with four developers. Uh, running, they developed it in Cloud Foundry and deployed it on Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry runs on a number of clouds, so it has this kind of um, uh, this ability for resilience across a number of clouds. And um, importantly, uh, so, so the number of clouds gave it the resilience, and um, it, the, uh, the 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 development and platform gave them the speed to be able to do this. So, um, so, so, so and that's something that they did two years ago. So for the last two Comic Reliefs, Comic Relief and Sport Relief. Both of those have run on some application that's been developed and run on Cloud Foundry. 
Um, okay, so when we so when we go back to talking about um, VCHS generally, what we say is that we think there's a number of uh, areas where we think this is good. So certainly, dev and test is certainly an important area. Packaged applications, because by default they'll all work on this work on work on VCHS. Disaster recovery, the first of those capabilities is here. Uh, the next generation apps really is here on the right is more to do with Cloud Foundry, and certainly people people can still develop you know new applications in Java or .NET or whatever they want to uh, in uh, in um, VCHS. So um, so we've touched on. Um, uh, some of the things that we've got, so we've, uh, but there are, there are more things coming. So disaster recovery, we, we've touched on that a little bit. The first element's here now, as I mentioned, but there is more to come, and it will move more to sort of site recovery manager-like capability, but that's probably about a year and a half away. Um, we will have a desktop as a service coming in uh, the third quarter, and likewise, there will be some sort of database as a service, probably a SQL Server and MySQL being the first, There'll be some object storage coming, PCI compliance coming, and some sort of ISP application catalog, the first elements of which are already uh, in place. So, it, so as you, you'll be able to see here that the bottom level, the infrastructure as a service, we've already started to build out. Again, there'll be more things coming here, such as the database, database layer and other things like that. We've got the PaaS layer coming in Q3, shortly already been announced. There will be desktop as a service and this catalog that I mentioned building out as well. So there'll be uh, quite a lot coming as far as uh, VCHS is concerned. So um, quite often then people uh, people say to me, how, where does VCHS fit relative to you know, the other cloud, cloud vendors that are out there, um, particularly AWS, but clearly Microsoft has Microsoft Azure. Google has Google Cloud now, so it's, um, we certainly expect to see more from them uh, as we move forward. So this slide that I'm going to show you is something that a colleague of mine, uh, Massimo Ruffera in, um, uh, in Italy, put together, actually. Um, this vertical line indicates uh, the difference between the um, new world, if you like, for want of a better term, the next generation apps where the resilience is perhaps designed into the um, into the software, and the world of traditional apps of enterprise apps, where um, you know Microsoft, of Oracle, and things like that. Now, AWS has done a brilliant job. Um, it's we don't know exactly how big AWS uh, AWS is, um, how big it is, because um, AWS doesn't split out the cloud part of its uh, business. But it's somewhere between one and a half billion and three billion, we think, and um, so it's done pretty well to have grown to that size in eight years. And not not surprisingly, AWS as a cloud is really designed for the new world, for the zingers and the um, uh, Netflixes and people like that. AWS is coming back more into the kind of enterprise world, trying to trying to look at that as well. Incidentally, Azure, perhaps surprisingly, coming from Microsoft, is also focused. You know, primarily in in this new world, and indeed Google is as well. Google is probably uh, aiming more at big data at the moment in this in this kind of cloud space. VCHS is really targeted at the old world at the moment. So, kind of unashamedly, VCHS is targeted at the old world, and the reason being that you know, though Amazon has done a brilliant job, and Amazon's really by far the biggest player here. Um, the amount of business that's in the cloud is still small relative to traditional workloads. So there's probably about four trillion worth of you know, traditional business out of here. Most of this still requires some of the kind of value that an, that a um, hybrid cloud could offer them. So VCHS really is targeting itself at this kind of business. So the problem that traditional IT has. Over time, VCHS will move to the right, and you've seen. Uh, some aspects of that with Cloud Foundry that I've just talked through, and also um, with other products that we'll have coming along um, uh, shortly in that space. So that, that's as a kind of rough uh, picture in terms of where we fit relative to some of the other big uh, big cloud vendors. So we're not um, uh, most of the others really are aiming at the new world. We perhaps slightly strangely are well not strangely because that's where the, where the business is. We are focusing really at the traditional world, uh, old world, if you like, if you'd like to call it that. 
Um, okay, so this is just kind of confirmation of that. So there are sort of 90 operating systems on the right which VMware supports. In fact, there's only 45 that they've listed up here, which I counted. Um, in, interestingly, we support more Windows uh, Microsoft operating systems than Microsoft does itself. Um, so you can see that um, as far as you know, applications are concerned and operating systems, uh, VMware is um, the sweet spot for VMware is running traditional workloads and those applications that currently exist. So, um, with uh, with that, then really, I wanted to um, just just step through where uh, j just to recap in terms of where the value is. So, one of the the values we think for traditional IT again is the ability to um, deliver some resource within hours rather than, than weeks. So an IT organization can expand its environment within a few hours rather than um, uh, perhaps weeks or months. Uh, and that should be able to offer some, some value to, to an IT organization because it means that they can respond much quicker to their customers, their, their business customers' needs. Um, longer term, and again, we're not expecting people to do this you know, immediately, but longer term, there could be some sort of a plan where one builds to one steady state, and those kind of peaks can be handled by uh, by VCHS. Indeed, if one didn't want to put one's most critical workload in VCHS initially, one could still put one's less critical workload into VCHS and free up more resource on premises for for the critical applications that that needed to uh, address that peak workload. So there there is a cost saving, a significant cost saving story that could be put forward. And many of the people on this call may have already made you know, good careers out of the cost savings that VMware has been able to deliver uh, to organizations so far. This, in some way, is a continuation of that, that same story. And really, there's this issue that as far as compliance and audits are concerned, I mean, it's not, you know, perhaps saying it's just another internal data center, maybe a little bit too trite, but it's very close to looking just like another internal data center as far as, um, you know, auditors and compliance is concerned. So, um, um, and in addition, we have this disaster recovery capability, which is available now, this piece of replication-based disaster recovery designed to uh, really replace, uh, well, designed for workloads that don't currently have um, a disaster recovery capability today. So with that, um, I think I'm just about um, a minute or two ahead of um, the 40 minutes or so that, um, that we plan to run through this. So with that, I'd like to um, hand back to uh, John and to Amy, and indeed to ask you if you'd like to ask any questions or have any comments or have any thoughts, um, I would be interested to, to hear what you have to say. Okay, so we have a couple of questions already. Um, mm -hmm. The first question is, uh, what VMware licensing must you have internally to connect? So uh, th there aren't any, uh, there aren't any um, specific licensing requirements uh, that a customer needs to have on-premise in order to connect to VCHS. So you don't need to have a specific um, version of the software in order to be able to connect to VCHS at all. You are just and, you, and so that's the first first I guess answer. The second thing is of course you don't need any licenses uh, as far as VCHS is concerned because you are simply purchasing a um, a service from us. So the answer is you don't need any any specific licensing level in order to access VCHS. Okay, thanks Chris. And we have one more question um, which says, um, so any DCs in APAC? Uh, in Asia Pacific? Do we have it? So at the moment there aren't any. There are plans in Asia Pacific to, um, to have a data center in Singapore a data center in Australia and a data center in Japan in 2014. Okay, and we have a few more questions coming in. Uh, the next one says, uh, what is stopping one from using, say, Veeam to facilitate to facilitate the DR? Um, the, um, the problem for Veeam at the moment is that when one's using VCHS, one doesn't have access to vCenter. 
Uh, and part of the reason is that um, the whole of VCHS is abstracted upper level, so you don't have access to vCenter. So uh, it means that one couldn't, use, one couldn't run Veeam in VCHS as it stands at the moment. So certainly we are in discussions with Veeam, but that couldn't, that couldn't operate. Uh, so one couldn't use Veeam at the moment because of the inability to access vCenter. Um, Veeam do have um, a, an offering, uh, a relatively new offering, I think, called Veeam Cloud Edition. And we are in discussions with Veeam about VCHS being one of the target points for Veeam Cloud Edition. But that, that Veeam Cloud Edition requires our object storage platform, which isn't available till later this year. Okay, and the next question, are connections made by vCloud connector? Um, no, what, well, one connect, yes, one connects, uh, one can use vCloud Connected to connect from on-premises into the um, VCHS environment. And within vCloud Connector, I think there is a simple um, uh, sort of uh, um, GUI to allow you to set up the, uh, the uh, SSL VPN connection uh, into the um, VCHS environment. So yes, one would use vCloud Connector. Okay, and a question from the same person, so from Jonathan. Are you in talks with Zerto as well? Uh, I don't think we are in talks with Zerto at the moment. Um, so, um, I, I, well, certainly not here. There may well be discussions with Zerto in the States, but certainly we're not in discussion. Or I, personally, I'm not in discussions with them uh, here. Um, I'm sure there is dialogue between us in the US. So clearly Zerto and Veeam are... You know, uh, you know, ISV companies we hear mentioned frequently. Okay, uh, just wait a couple more minutes, see if there's any more questions. So I, I would be interested actually as well for any of the people out there in terms of what they think, you know, as well, whether they think this is a good idea or um, it's value or Indeed, whether they think some of the things I've said are don't make sense or you know do make sense, and indeed don't make sense would be <laughs> I'd be interested to hear, interested to hear as well. Yep. So if you do have any feedback, um, just pop it in the in the critique form that's at the end. Um, so Chris, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Oh, hold on. Okay. Oh, sorry, one more just popped up. Um, so this question says, would would you need to access, would need to access to vCenter in the cloud? Um, maybe that, maybe that's supposed to say, what, what would you need to access to vCenter in the cloud? Well, I think this, this might relate to Veeam, what the Veeam discussion we had before. So as a general rule, all those, all those software products that require access to vCenter, uh, can't be used within VCHS because um, because VCHS doesn't give you access to vCenter. So uh, and 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 that's because VCHS is abstracted upper level, um, so that um, uh, because it's really just de delivering some resource rather than necessarily delivering the underlying uh, uh, the, um, capability. I think there's some issues that everyone had access to. Uh, to uh, to vCenter within vCHS, um, you know, potentially there'll be more risk of bringing vCHS, uh, potentially bringing it down, I suppose. So one doesn't have access to access to vCenter. So that's really the kind of key thing for some of those ISV products like Zerto and uh, and Veeam. Now I think going forward there might be some some other way forward, accessing APIs and things like that. Uh, I'm pretty certain that we're in some of those sorts of discussions with with Veeam. Uh, I don't know about Zerto, um, but just to be clear, when one does access VCHS, one gets some resource, but one doesn't get access to vCenter in the traditional way that one may be used to on-premises. So I don't know if that's answered that last question or not, um, but that's the kind of limitation um, as far as using Veeam is concerned, uh, which I know has come up, come up a number of times. And Veeam, you know, Veeam's you know, done very well for itself, 
is growing very rapidly and is a good uh, a good way of copying VMs, a good way of offering kind of backup and um, recovery of VMs. It copies VM, you know, VMs over. So it's you know compatible really with the kind of VMware story. Okay, thank you, Chris. And that okay. is all the questions we have today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar.